Good morning. Welcome, as Lori said, welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. Welcome to this service, The Net. My name is Casey Crimmins, and we're so uh, glad, we're so excited to have you with us this morning. It's the beginning of Advent. That's right, yeah. Party. It's the beginning of Advent. I'm excited. We, we did this last year, so let me kind of give you a preamble before we get in. So, uh, Advent is a time for those that maybe were in more traditional churches growing up know that Advent series or season is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Okay, a lot of times it's going to fall in November, which to me is weird, uh, but it's okay because we just got finished doing this. We're going to tumble right in. We got a month, but what it does is it gives us time to prepare. It gives us time and space amidst the chaos and the craziness to prepare. So I love that. I love that we got to do that last year. I love that we're doing it again. So for those of you that were here last year, you know that we did this thing called Advent Conspiracy. And for some, it was just kind of like, what's this weird thing the church is doing? This year, now that you had a chance to do that last year, Brian Mateer, our director of missions, brought it in last year. Now that we had a chance to kind of get a flavor for it, this year I want to give you the opportunity to go a bit deeper, to to maybe up the ante, up our commitment to what's going on. I want to give you some opportunities to do that. Because what's Advent Conspiracy? So the video does a great job, and it's wonderful when I don't have to talk about it as much, but it's basically saying, let's recapture, let's reclaim what Christmas was supposed to be about. All right, let's reclaim what this thing, this this Adventist occasion was supposed to be about, that we as as Americans, and and just be honest, most of uh, the world has veered away from, and let's get back to what it was. Because it's a weird thing. And I remember talking about this last year. It's a weird thing is uh, Bible-believing Christians, uh, those that love Christ and come to church on a regular basis, loving Jesus, coming in, doing Sunday school, that stuff. It's like we get close to Christmas and our brains like explode. It's like all the money that Target and Marshalls and Amazon.com is spending, the billions of dollars to program our brains works even on us. Because it's, it's weird. It's like, anybody watch the Panthers game any chance? Any Panthers fans in the, in the place? All right, couple. Perfect. Now I know who's not here on Panthers Day. Anyway, keep going. Let's go. So Panthers won, right? It was this awesome thing. They're, they're doing awesome this season. Things are great. Undefeated. But it's a weird thing. It's, it's like Christmas is like if everybody on the planet, for the most part, became a Panthers fan all of a sudden. And like they're wearing blue and Cam Newton. Yeah, we love that guy. Singing songs about him. And you're like, you know who Cam Newton is? This is all, yeah. We're all like, on, for a month, it's like that's what happens. We're all wearing the same colors. We're all singing the same songs. We're all talking about the same thing. And yet, in the midst of it, what we're trying to do in Advent Conspiracy, as a conspiracy, is to rip away all the stuff that wasn't supposed to be in there and rethink Christmas. So a couple ways that uh, we're going to ask you, I'm going to allow you, I'm going to invite you to be a part of this with us this year. Uh, There's two major ways. One, uh, next week, it's not this week because I knew no one would be ready for it, but just start to think and prepare your heart. Next week in the welcome pad will be uh, commitment cards. So basically asking you to commit to covenant with us as a church body and say, I'm gonna, we're going to do this. We're going to give this thing a whirl this year, and we're actually going to uh, put pen to paper and, and, and turn that in. Now, uh, this isn't going to be for everybody. Okay, N- not that it's not available to everybody, but this isn't for everyone. And, and hear me in this. I, I don't want, and what we don't want, is a begrudged signature on a piece of cardstock. Okay, that's not, that's not what we need from you. That's not what you need to be spending your time doing. What this is, is a way for us as a family, as a body of believers to say, you know what, maybe, maybe in my household this year, young and old, maybe we put pen to paper and say, this year we're going to think about this a little bit differently. We're going to do this a little bit differently. And if you do that, and if you commit to, to doing that, well, there's some, uh, ramif- there's some implications in that, and, and I'm going to ask you to participate in something that we're going to be calling the Advent Conspiracy Offering that, believe it or not, is not going to cost you a dime more than what you spent last year at Christmas. Well, how is that possible? Well, if those of you that know where we're going and just watch what's going on here, 
as you participate and you spend less on the sweater that no one cares about, on the electronic that did nothing for your life but you thought it was going to, or whatever it is that you spend less on, we're going to give you an opportunity to give more and entrust this church with what you give more to then allow us to go with our strategic partners, our ministry partners in the local community and give more and give more. So uh, next week, if that's you, or as the weeks go on, I'll be reminding you, and you and your family want to get together and have a discussion about this, maybe over lunch, maybe kids, you want to talk with mom and dad about this and say, I want to try this. Next week, we'll give you something so you can sign it, drop it in the offering, or give it at the guest services table, and we're going to watch what happens from there. All right? Okay. Good deal. Who's in? Anybody in? Don't, don't tell me yet. You can sign next week. Um, this week... We're going we're gonna to start at the foundation. This, this concept of, of worshiping fully. Worship fully. Because it all starts here. The foundation of the next four weeks starts here to understand what we're doing. Because here's what worship is. I mean, worship is the affections of your heart being changed or, or radically moving in the direction of something, and then everything else follows, right? Your, your affections are moving in this direction, and then uh, you change. If all of a sudden you don't like the Carolina Panthers anymore— you're not excited about what just happened, right? If all of a sudden your affections have changed and you're, I don't know, a Giants fan, something? Who's doing bad this year? Anyway, right? Your affections change, your heart changes, and your actions change. So we have to know what we're worshiping, and we have to know what it is to worship fully. So to do that, we're basically going to tear through the entire Christmas story. I, I listened to Dave message this morning. He and I are preaching on the same thing. It's funny. We're going to take you all the way to the finish line and then bring you all the way back, and then we're going to redo it over the next month. So to do that, let's go to Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you that that word is true. I thank you that we can gather around it this morning in preparation, in preparing our hearts to uh, receive the newborn king. I pray that you'd move radically in power this morning, that you'd open our eyes, that you'd allow us to rethink a bit, allow us to engage with you. We know that's not possible without your spirit. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, worship fully. This is how we're going to go about this this morning. Uh, we're going to look at the three main characters, three main people and people groups in the Advent story, in the birth of Jesus story, and talk about different aspects of our worship and how we then engage and worship fully. All right, so the first character, the first person in this story is Joseph. And we're talking about worshiping through obedience. If you have your Bible this morning, please turn to Matthew. It's like the first book of the New Testament. You can open it up. Chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18. I'll give you a second to turn there. And you can follow along on the screen behind me. It says this, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she uh, was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which also means God with us. A lot of us know that. Then continue on. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So, so a lot of times, our uh, worship to God is not very glory-filled. 
It's not very glorious. Uh, No one's throwing you a parade for not fudging your taxes. Uh, No one's going to, you know, celebrate a party for you, uh, kids, for not lying to your parents. And yet, that uh, act of obedience is one of the most foundational and basic understandings of what worship is to the Lord. Joseph came in willful, willful obedience to the Lord, and he responded that he would do what the Lord had commanded him. Okay, so let's, let's talk. What, what has the Lord called us to do, commanded us to do? When we look at those things, we start to understand that what he's called us to do through the laws, through different things in Scripture that tell us uh, they're countercultural. They're, they're very different from things that are around us. They make us act kind of funny. They make us uh, look kind of funny sometimes. They make us talk a little bit funny sometimes. And it was on purpose. When the Lord called out the Israelites in the beginning and gave them these things that was going to make them look a little bit silly, a little bit different, it was on purpose. That, that willful act, when he said, I'm commanding you to do these things, they're willful obedience to that was worship. The, the, the actual act of, of saying, okay, I'm just going to do this, was worship. And it's the foundation. Because out of that, out of understanding that God, uh, as we talked about in this series, once you know who he is, the series before we just talked about the attributes of God, once you know who he is, it becomes way easier to, to obey him. Right? It becomes a bit easier to understand what he's saying and to obey him. And yet, in that act of obedience, understanding, believing in him, and then obeying him is the most basic and ground level thing that we can do to worship him, just like Joseph. Because think about Joseph's, whoa, think about Joseph's situation. Joseph, a young man, uh, betrothed, uh, wife is off, like visiting family. She comes back three months pregnant. Okay, just, we glaze over these stories and think they're, you know, just kind of the Christmas story. Young man, engaged, wifey comes home and she's showing. Okay, people are doing the math in their head and and they haven't done anything that would have allowed them to to make this baby. Uh, So chances are he would have had some ridicule. And he even says in here that he had it in mind to divorce her quietly because it was the law that said that that was okay. That that, yeah, if if she's gone out and done that, you're, you're okay. But what is the angel revealing? What is this dream revealing? He's like, no, 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 no. That 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 was the Holy Spirit. You actually have to stay in this thing by law. But by law, you are staying in this marriage, and I'm commanding you to do that. And out of his response of obedience to that, he brought the Lord worship. And obviously, the Lord ended up using that. We, uh, if you look at 1 Samuel 5.22, it's not going to be up there, but just as I was studying, uh, something that just is, is huge for us to get that the uh, heart issue and the, the brain issue around this is, is, is huge. First Samuel 5.22, uh, a prophetic word given to the Israelites as they're coming into the promised land and man, they're getting kind of skewed, uh, says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. Why? Well, because when you're obeying, when you're willfully obeying what he's commanded you, well, then everything starts to kind of, there are outshoots of that. There are outcrops of that. If you are simply coming and begrudgingly sacrificing, and we're going to talk about that sacrificial system in a second, if you're just sacrificing out of begrudgingness, the Lord's saying, that's meaningless to me, and that your obedience is what is worship. So that was Joseph. Uh, second one we're going to talk about is Mary. If you have your Bible, uh, Luke, uh, again, first chapter in there. We're going to be talking about these stories. So if you, if you love hearing the Bible stories about uh, Jesus being birthed, you're going to love the rest of this morning because we're going to basically talk about all of them. So Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. 
to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary's response, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. Okay, so we talked about uh, obedience, and and now we're talking about submission. And I want to pair these things uh, slightly apart because they they, they are very intangent sometimes, but uh, definitely apart. I want to read you a quote from Dave's sermon this morning. It was just so good I had to say it. Um, The two are related but different. Obedience is an outward action while submission is is an inward attitude. Okay, so there's the obedience to the law, the the commands, the decrees. Submission is like next level type stuff. It's like next level where you're going, okay, like I get what you're actually calling me to do. I get what you're saying to do, like the laws. Submission is the next level of, okay, like the nuances of life. The nuances, not the things that God said, don't do this or do this, but the nuances of life and what you're going to wrap your life around out of and from that obedience. God had a design uh, for us. He then had uh, a uh, purpose and plans for us. Some of us know the verse, for I know the plans for you. They're good plans to prosper you, all those things. There's plans. Uh, The design that he had for us is found in his laws. Okay, the laws that the Israelites had were a construct that he put into place to say, this is what's going to set you apart. And oh, by the way, I made you. I know how it works. So this is how it is. Countercultural, you know, sometimes in the church today, we can get kind of fumbled up in this because we're like, well, the rest of the culture is kind of moving this direction. Shouldn't we do that? No. The whole point was for us to be different. So that's the construct. Then the purposes and plans is where we find the submission. The purpose and the plans are then going, God, whatever you want, whatever uh, in me that you don't already have, take it. I'm going to submit to you willfully that you can then uh, shape, mold, and carry out the purposes and plans that you have. Uh, They're they're slightly different. Uh, um, Joseph was commanded, okay? It was basically, you cannot divorce this woman. That's not the law, okay? She didn't cheat on you. It's the law. You can't do it. That's the command. He obeys. Mary has a very different situation, all right? This is the angel, okay, Gabriel, coming down and going, Mary, something crazy is going to happen through you, and the plan's going to be carried out. Would she have been disobedient to say no? Would she have gone against the laws and decrees of the land if she said, you know, Gabriel, maybe next door, Kathy, uh, she might be a better, uh, she's a mom already and kind of knows what she's like. like. She could have done that. Would not have gone against the law. Yet what do we see? Her response. Yes, Lord. Yeah, May it be as you've said, may what you're talking about come to fruition. It ain't going to be easy. I don't know how I'm going to explain this to uh, my my dear love, Joseph. I don't know if he's going to believe me that an angel came, let alone like the archangel Gabriel. Uh, But whatever your will, whatever your plans, I'm going to submit to them. And this is, this is where it gets like nuanced because then you go, well, well, what does that mean? Like, how do I find that out? Because I can look at the laws. I can look at the, the decrees of God. I can flip that thing open and, and pretty much kind of jump in. But, but how do I know what God's calling me to outside of that? Because when you, when you submit to that, it's worship, again, to, to the next level because now it's all the fringe stuff. Okay, Uh, some of you know that we made kind of a vocational change over the last year and a half. 
God wouldn't have said you're, you're disobedient and hey, you're breaking my commands if I didn't. But I said, I, I, I don't know, Lord, like wh- whatever, whatever you want. You know, some of us get like inklings in us. Some of us have friends that like put things out there for us. Some of us read scripture and are stirred in our hearts. We're like, Lord, I know I'm not like disobedient to your law by not doing this, but man, what, what are you doing? And it's like obedience. Obedience is like the training ground for that. Obedience and, and saying yes, as Eric was praying before, saying yes to God out of obedience. The things that are, you know, pretty black and white all of a sudden trains you up to start to go, I'm going to say yes to that thing that is a bit nuanced. I'm going to, I'm going to listen. I'm going to actively engage with the Lord and the things around me and, and find that and say yes. Because when we are in a position, when we are postured in a position of yes, Lord, yes, Lord, okay, yes, Lord, when that thing tumbles forward, when that big life change event or that small nuanced decision comes your way, you're now postured to continue in worship and to take it to the level of submission. That's what Mary was called to do. Had to fully trust, had to fully engage. And because she was already postured in that position, it was easy. I don't, I don't know if I could say it was easy. Let's be honest. I don't know if it was easy. But it's recorded that she said, yeah, Lord, whatever you want, it's yours. The last characters we're going to visit. So uh, obedience, Joseph, submission, Mary. The last characters in here are the the Magi or uh, wise men, kings, talked about different ways. Matthew 2 is going to be the first 11 verses. If you got your Bible, crack it back open. Just keep turning. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that he was, uh, heard this, he was disturbed. Uh, and let, let me just tell you, so King Herod is kind of going, man, I, I'm the king. Why, why do you think there needs to be another king? So that's why he's a, a bit disturbed, a little perturbed. He's like a maniacal sociopath from everything that we understand. He was very like power hungry. And so he's got these magi saying some stuff to him. He's going, okay, well, actually, let's see what he says. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. They're they're just quoting some Old Testament prophet stuff. So this is them saying, we've been hearing about this for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, We know where he is. They, They tell that to him. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Uh, That's a bold-faced lie. Okay, kiddos, this this is a lying king. Not Not so good. Okay, so just know that. He was lying. He had no intention of doing good things. In fact, later he ordered that all the children that time to be slaughtered. So this guy's not good. Anyway, after they'd heard this, they went on their way, and the star uh, they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm, I, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade, just real quick for a second. Um, when we set up our nativity scene and, and we have the three wise men, we do too, uh, it's probably not incredibly historically accurate, okay? They, they probably traveled for months uh, to try to get where they were going, rising uh, from where they were coming. I'm going to talk about it in a second to get there. They came later. It even says that they went to their house. Uh, so kind of a different story. Magi, as we uh, may or may not understand, magi where we get magician. Uh, they aren't necessarily the ones that are performing uh, tricks, but they were super 
high officials. Uh, we see in the Old Testament uh, in Daniel, uh, the, the position of magi was like basically counsel to the king. Uh, so very important guys, and they're traveling all the way uh, here. And, and their sacrifice, what they brought to the table, or their uh, worship was sacrifice. And they did it in three uh, big kind of buckets of, of, of how they brought worship. So they see something and they're responding to it. There's a star in the sky. They know what that means. And, and they go and they, they bring three types of sacrifice. One is their time. As I said, uh, it probably took them months. The reason I know that or, or can infer that is that chances are... Uh, they probably were from either Babylon or uh, if, if, if it was really extreme, like India or the Asia area, chances are Babylon, which uh, the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem was some like 800 miles, 750 to 800 miles to, to get there. That they're traveling on camel, okay? They, they see response, they jump on their camels and they make their way there. And then once they get there, they have to go to Bethlehem. So they gave time. They said, what's going on right now? The thing that that was prophesied, the thing that's going on out there is worth our time to go check it out in worship. As a response in worship, that as their heart's affections were drawn to this thing, they gave their time. Next, sacrificially. They gave their talents. And I know this seems kind of silly uh, because we talk about time, talents, and then like we put the subcontent, like money. Uh, But with time, talents, uh, like I said, they're like high officials. They're they're, they're people giving advice to the king. This might be a horrible example, but I'm going to say it anyway. It'd be like if Biden was like, hey, Barack, man, I saw a star. I'm going to take off two months. I'll be back. Actually, two months, then the trip back at whatever time. Okay, I'm going to go on for six months. Let me know if you need anything. I don't have a cell phone. Never mind. Don't tell. I'm just leaving. Like that, that's kind of crudely what it would be. They left and, and took with them the usefulness that they had where they were because what they were going to worship was worth it. That the time to get there as well as the kind of opportunity cost of what they would have been doing while they were back uh, serving that king was worth it to them. I said, that's, that's what we're bringing. That's what we're sacrificing and bringing to the table. But what else? They brought their treasures. Right? They didn't, they didn't like, saddle up in Babylon, uh, make the way out, travel that entire way months, and finally get there. And they're like, hey, this is great. Thanks, man. I'm out. Like, they didn't come empty-handed. They didn't come to the king of kings and lord of lords, the one prophesied for hundreds of years, uh, waiting in expectation for this new king. They didn't come to him and go, hey, this was really great, man. Great house. This is, I'm going I'm to have, no, they brought something. They brought things of value. And, and what's cool with these things, if, if you research it, if you get a little bit deeper, you realize that each of the gifts kind of had a prophetic uh, meaning, but also like a really just just meaningful, uh, 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 what you just want to give to somebody. A necessity. So let's look, at, let's look at gold. Okay, gold is usually a present for a king. Pro- prophetically saying that this baby, this month, two, three month old baby is one day going to be a king. So, so here, here's gold, represent that. It's also really useful if you're a new parent to be given a bunch of money right? That's, that's something useful that you might need at some point. Maybe you buy baby Jesus some nice diapers or something. I don't know what they made him at, right? Like that's really useful. The second thing, frankincense. Uh, the prophetic aspect of this is that frankincense was usually burned, usually an incense, kind of the rising prayers of the saints. This was usually a priestly thing, prophetically speaking to the fact that Jesus one day would be the high priest, the one that would intercede on our behalf, seated at the right hand, up there doing his thing. Prophetically, he's three months old, and they're giving him that, like, yes, the priest to come. But also, really useful. Anybody heard of essential oils ever? Essential oil. Come on, don't be, don't be shy about it. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, ladies. So my wife got into essential oils, got one of those little packet things and those things, and it's hilarious because frankincense is in there. And I'm like, dude, this is what they gave to Jesus? 
A, it smells beautiful. So ladies, if you like run out of perfume, you want to throw some on there, even dudes, it kind of like unisex, just saying. But, but also, uh, it's useful for like anything. It's like the new Windex. You're like, oh, I got a burn. Oh, I feel so much better. Oh, I got a rash. Okay, put that on there. Oh, I got like a pimple. Okay, put some frankincense on. Like it's useful for all sorts of stuff. Maybe even for a baby. And they're saying, yeah, here, here you go. It has uses beyond compare. And then the last one, myrrh. This one's a little interesting to wrap your head around, but, but go with me for a second. So myrrh uh, was used during the embalming process of, of dead people, okay? Um, prophetically, almost mourning in advance the fact that Jesus was going to die, and not just like die, because everybody dies, but, but mourning his death because his death was going to mean something incredible for them. So, so again, uh, here, here's our myrrh, and it's, you know, Joseph and Mary are like, oh, interesting. But then realizing, okay, for us, we might think that way. Myrrh, uh, same as kind of the frankincense, has like a billion uses. I looked it up last night. I'm, I'm going to like take some stock in myrrh. It's good for like decongestants, anti-inflammatory. It's like the new ibuprofen, Tylenol. You just take some of that and like you're, you're all better. Might get some for you, Eric, actually. We were talking about that. So, so again, might be useful. Might be like really useful for parents to go, oh, thank you. We need this, but, but that. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing us through all this is that uh, when you start at the top layer, when you start at the top layer with, with obedience and this, this yes to God, this willful, okay, yes, like I understand your commands. And then you move on to uh, the next layer, which is that kind of up in the ante of submission, that inward uh, bowing down and saying, yeah, like I get it. Uh, usually that submission, usually that submission is going to require sacrifice. That these, these two things go hand in in hand. Actually, all of these things go hand in hand. Because uh, back in the day, when God was teaching his people how to worship him, one of the first worship services, do you know what the, wor- the, the first worship services that they had w- was up on a mountain. A- and, and Abraham had to bring his son. And, and, and God asked him to sacrifice him. But what did he say to his servants? He says, hey, we're going up to, to worship. And then all through the Levitical law, it's this continual discussion and dialogue about these rituals and these sacrifices. And he says, this is how you're going to worship me. You're going to slaughter calves to cover some sins. You're going to slaughter goats to to get rid of this and and to make atonement for these things. And I'm going to teach you that your worship of me is going to cost you something. Okay, that bull, that cow, that goat, that ram, somebody had to pay for that thing. And in the same way, when we come to the Lord and we figure out what this thing of worshiping fully is, it's uh, the foundation of obedience. It's then saying, Lord, I submit to you. I don't know what the plans are, but man, I'm going to submit to them and ask you to reveal. And out of that submission, your desires, your wants, your things that you think you need, and the Lord's going, nah, man, just come. It's probably going to require some form of sacrifice. So, so let's think on this for, for just a second. Worship fully. How do we worship fully? Are you worshiping fully? And you can go right down there through that list and be like, Lord, where am I in my obedience to you? The things that are just black and white. The lifestyle that you call me to live, the things I'm supposed to do, the words I'm supposed to say or not say, I mean, just the black and white. Am I even there yet? And and if I'm kind of good in that section, okay, am I submitted to you? Am I submitted to your plans? Am I submitted to the things you're calling me to that are a little bit black and, not black and white, a little gray? And if all those things are happening, Am I bringing sacrificially? Am I coming to the table sacrificially in all the things that I do? Time, talent, money, whatever it is. And maybe the, the, the proper question as we head out, as we start this season, as we contemplate these things, because again, we, we got to get the worship fully right. Maybe the question is, are we worshiping something else? 
Is there something else that's taking those things? Again, worship comes out of a heart of affection. Is there something in our life so alluring, so drawing of our affection that our, our time, our talents, our finance, our resources are being channeled in a direction and then we're going, yeah, and I'll just give the leftovers to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'll, I'll, I'll drop something in there. But the sacrifice, the giving of those things has to start with the heart. Sacrifice means nothing without the obedience. So as we uh, rise this morning, as we end this time that we have together, I I just want to ask you, are you worshiping fully? Am I worshiping fully? And may we ask the Lord to show us, reveal to us what maybe that next level is. Would you stand with us? Let's worship.